Well, good morning. My name is Faith Taylor, and it's my privilege to welcome you here today. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're just thankful the Lord has you here. In just a minute, the choir is going to be coming out, and they'll lead us in some songs, and then Brother Chad will have a message for us from God's Word. If you um, are a guest with us today, we're so thankful to have you here too. And we have a special gift for you. After the service is over, if you'll just head back to the link desk, we'd love to get that to you. And we'd love to connect with you. And we found the best way to do that is to ask you to text the word CONNECT to 256-223-9955. For a list of all of our other announcements, you can check out our bulletin or follow us on social media. We've got a lot of good stuff going on around here. Now, Brother Chad's going to come and lead us in a time of prayer. Well, good morning. Uh, As we start off every service, we're going to start off this morning with a time of prayer. And so we just invite you to come down and kneel here at the altar. We have several things we want to be mindful of and prayerful through. And so we thank you for being here this morning. So at this time, would you just come and join us in this time of prayer. Maybe you want to stay at your seat. Maybe you want to come and you say, kneeling's hard for me, but you can sit right here at these front pews and just pray alongside us. So let's pray together. God, before we do anything else, Father, we come before you, Father, just confessing our need for you this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, your power. Father, we thank you, God, for such a sweet gift that you have given us to be able to gather together as believers and praise the name of our God, to give you praise, to acknowledge you before all people, Father, that you are the ruler of the world who has provided for us a great salvation in Jesus Christ. Father, now we come to you, Lord, just confessing not just our need for you, but God, just confessing, Father, that we're a broken people, God, and that we have committed things against you, Father. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the promise of Scripture, God, that you have taken those things and nailed them to the cross. So, Father, we just rejoice. We rejoice in your grace and forgiveness. This morning, Father, we come before you praying, God, for Israel. Father, we pray for those surrounding nations. God, we pray for our nation. Father, we ask you, Lord, to remind us from your word that your word teaches us these times are going to come. So, Father, let us not be fearful. Let us not look at things as if you are not in control. But instead, God, let us intercede, Father, for the people there. And God, let us be sent on mission. God, there's great urgency. Father, there's things reminding us that life is short right now. So Father, let us not shrink back from the mission of our God to reach every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. But instead, God, let us look at it. Father, that you so loved the world, that you gave your one and only son. So Father, we pray, God, that we'd be reaching those so that whoever believes God, would know eternal life. Father, we pray specifically this morning for missionaries that are on the field trying to reach people, God, from Iran and Afghanistan. Father, to reach people, Lord, who uh, are Hebrews. Father, Jewish, believe, uh, Jewish people, God, that need Jesus. Father, we pray for them. And God, we know that world situations make it harder sometimes. So, God, we pray, Father, for our missionaries as they serve you. Father, we pray, God, that you would remind them of your great love and your great plans for them in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray, God, you would remind us, Father, to love our enemies. Father, we pray, God, you would remind us this morning to forgive those who have done us wrong, Father, to pray for those who persecute us. Father, we pray this morning, God, that this place would be a place of freedom for people. Father, and as we observe, God, the Lord's Supper, Father, we pray, God, that you be glorified in everything that is said and done here today. Remind us today of your faithfulness, of your perseverance, of the goodness of our God. And remind us today, Father, that your mercies are new this morning. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you. I pray blessings on the people that are here this morning. And I ask us, Lord, that as we leave here today, would we be a blessing to the people who are not here this morning. 
Father, use us in powerful ways to tell people about Jesus. We ask it humbly, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and sing with me? What a fellowship, what a joy divine. There's a reason why
Today we have a group of ladies that are going to be leaving this week to go to the Ridgecrest Conference Center. Uh, they're going to go there to serve others. And I appreciate these ladies who are going to give their free time to go serve others. We have Linda Rhodes, we have Cindy Wood, and we have Norma Rogers and Martina Melson. So we're thankful that they are going. We just want to pray for them, that they would be able to show Christ to others and uh, to be able to make it back safe. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you provide opportunities where we can serve. And Father, I thank you for these ladies who are going to give their free time to go serve others. I thank you that they're willing to give people food, to help clean, and to work in bookstores and other needs. We thank you for their servant heart, and we thank you for watching over them and bringing them back when they come back safely. We trust you with, with these ladies, and we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name, amen.
get up and preach after that singing you got problems right and so we'll see if we got problems this morning or not amen hey we love you and we're so thankful now I know you want to come back tonight and hear some more of that from our worship and uh, choir and, and orchestra they have been working so hard on this night of worship and so y'all come back tonight and enjoy a time as we journey through themes from the book of Hebrews and that's where we're going to be this morning in the book of Hebrews. We are so thankful uh, for our walk through the word. We're so thankful for you and on this moment, on this day uh, where we observe the Lord's Supper, we just want to remind you just to go ahead and start investigating your lives and confessing sin to the Lord and, and preparing your hearts to receive uh, this from his table uh, out of a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving, but also a spirit that rejoices in his salvation. Now, our goal today is that we're going to explore one of the most controversial texts in all the Bible. Aren't you glad you came today? Amen. You ever seen Baptists get into a good fight? All right, well, it won't be here today, but it may be after the service, right? When you have to think. Uh, my prayer is that as we journey through Hebrews chapter 6, uh, that we'll come away saying, it is well with my soul. Not, I can't believe he said that up there. I, I don't, that's not the way I read that text. Uh, and so just understand that theologians from John MacArthur and Charles Spurgeon, difference, uh, have, have great differences about this text. John Calvin, Benjamin Keach uh, from years ago have great differences about this text. So here I am, a, a boy from the mountains of eastern Kentucky. You think I'm going to be able to explain all this to you? We'll find out. The Holy Spirit uh, will do great things, hopefully. Uh, but we want, want you to be reminded. I'm reminded of a time when I was sitting uh, right up here, about where Shannon is, maybe just a little bit higher. And I'm reminded that uh, clapping broke out at Woodmont Baptist Church. Amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know those songs that are filled with a little soul power, and they get us going and get us clapping and all those kind of things. And if you know me well enough, you know I can't play anything. I, I don't have any rhythm in my body at all, right? I mean, I, I struggle in, in the life, and it makes me so jealous of people who can play an instrument. It makes me jealous of people who can dance. Uh, not that I would get envious as a pastor or anything, right? And especially not over dancing, okay? Uh, but if I were to get jealous over dancing, that's what I would get jealous over that, okay? Anyway, so you walk through this process, and I remember that as clapping overtook the sanctuary. You know how it starts? It starts with one person usually, and they start clapping. They start feeling it a little bit. And then you know us Baptists, you know, we see somebody else doing it. We're going to copy it, right? And, and so we start clapping and everybody else starts clapping and it starts working its way up the balcony. And, and in those moments, I get scared. Okay. When it, when it start coming close to me, cause, cause you know, when you're serving on staff, people watch you a little different, right? And I'm reminded in that time I started clapping I started trying my best to clap on beat. Okay. Which was doomed from the start. And it was so bad. Apparently and one of my best friends looked at me and looked, looked over at me and said, would you grow up? Can you believe he said that to me? And, and I'm reminded of that moment. And so every, every time clapping starts to break out, don't, don't think I'm less spiritual than you are that can clap on beat. It's just I, I clap. I try to make a joyful noise, but sometimes it's off beat, okay? And, and I think as we read from Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 6, what we get to hear is a great message where the author of Hebrews looks at the church and he says, would you grow up, right? And so hopefully you'll receive this in the right spirit. It says in chapter 5, starting with verse 11, we have a great deal to say about this. It's talking about Jesus being our great high priest. You can come back tonight and hear more about that. It says, we have a great deal to say about this and it is difficult to explain. Since you have become too lazy to understand, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you in the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. 
Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. And then in verse uh, chapter 6, therefore, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. Let's pray together. God, we love you. Father, we do pray, God, that we would grow mature. Father, if you permit. Father, we pray, God, it's done by your spirit, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would do such a great work, Father, that people would see your good works and and boast in the Lord our God. Father, we pray, God, that we would not become lazy or or, uh, in, in situations where we just become content in our spiritual growth. We become lazy and neglect the truth of your word. Father, we pray, God, that instead we would be teachers of your word. Father, that we would move from elementary things, Father, to advanced things for under the Spirit's God and under his instruction to us. Father, we pray, God, that we'd be found faithful. We pray that when you come back, Father, to receive your bride, we could present the body of Christ as mature in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these moments where we can study your word, where we can observe the Lord's Supper, and you can remind us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Father, we ask you to bless our time together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So here's what we see here is there's this great urgency to become mature in Christ. He's saying, you've settled, you become lazy, you quit understanding, and you've quit seeking and studying the word. You've, you've settled in, in elementary things instead of wanting to become teachers. And so in Colossians 1, verses 28 and 29, Paul says something similar. He says, we proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this. So Paul's labor was to present the church mature. He says, I strive with his strength that works powerfully in me. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul writes and he says, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. And then, of course, we know that in Romans 12, Paul would encourage us to live our lives as living sacrifices and that we would renew our mind through Scripture and that we would be able to discern the good and perfect and pleasing will of our God. And so there's this constant encouragement for us to grow mature. Have you ever grown frustrated with people in your life that constantly stay at an immature state? Have you grown frustrated with people like that? Spouses, don't raise your hand too quickly, right? Jana, put your hand down, all right? And that's enough, that's enough, right? But you have these moments, right? When you, when you grow frustrated with people who, who stay immature and they continue to dwell on things that are, are places of immaturity. And so this is what the frustration is for the first early church here. This group of Hebrews that have come out of the law and out of the legalistic followings of the law from the Old Testament. And, and they're tempted now to turn back and to go back into those things. And we're going to get into that, but, but they're tempted to do that. And he's saying, no, no, no. He said, you all haven't even advanced to the good things, to the good doctrines, to, to the great teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You've stayed in this basic milk and those kind of things. It's like when church members at other churches say this about a pastor, well, I'm not getting fed. Well, the goal of a pastor is is not to necessarily uh, take all the responsibility to do your daily feedings. The goal of a pastor is to equip you to help you be able to feed yourself. That's growing in maturity, right? And to understand that that as we preach the word and as we teach the word, uh, every sermon, every message is going to hit you differently than it hits a different person because we're at different places in our spiritual walk and in our spiritual growth. I'm reminded as a kid, uh, I used to watch a long-standing show. It would come on right before we'd leave for school, and it, it was the Bozo show. You remember Bozo the Clown? Y'all remember that? And do you remember they had the grand prize game, like toward the end of the show? And do you remember they had six buckets, and, and they would make these kids come out there, and they'd stand them right at the line. And I thought, how in the world is that kid out of school right now? That's what was going through my mind. How, I could never be on that show because my mom and dad going to make me go to school, right? But I was always envious. I'm confessing a lot of sin about being envious of people today. But I was always envious of the kid that got out there and they'd be standing right there and bucket number one is right at their feet, right? And they 
they'd take that ping pong ball and they'd have to throw it into bucket number one. And then they'd have to toss it into bucket number two, toss it into bucket number three. And if they got to bucket number six, you remember when Bozo the Clown did this? He'd break out a crisp $100 bill. You remember this? Take it out of those pocket, out of those blue pants, right? Big old hair flowing in the wind, right? And that $100 bill, and he'd go, if you make it in bucket number six, the grand prize game. You get this grand prize. And sometimes they give a bicycle along with it, right? And he'd put that $100 bill in that sixth bucket. And you'd watch these kids get all nervous. they get worked up, right? And you'd see them. And sometimes they'd get all the way to bucket number five. And then they'd bounce it off, right? And every once in a while, you'd see someone make it all the way to bucket number six. And then I'd get jealous. That could have been me. That could have been me. But occasionally, you see one of them. And they'd come up there with all the confidence in the world, wouldn't they? In bucket number one, literally, all they have to do is bend over and put it in the bucket. That's it. That's it. And, and you'd see them. And I, I guess it was nerves of being on TV and becoming major TV stars right in that moment. And you see a kid and he'd take it and he'd throw it and it missed bucket number one. And, and you know, it's almost like Bozo was shocked, right? I mean, that put a, a sad face on a clown's face. And you'd see that moment and, and he would be shocked that they missed bucket number one. And this is what this apostle, this writer of the book of Hebrews is telling us. He's saying, some of you haven't been able to move past bucket number one. Some of you haven't even been able to get past that. And it's literally the basic. It, all you got to do is bend over and get it. Right? And so he goes through six items that, that are in this. It serves as pairs of teachings. And look what he says. He says, therefore, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God. So there's the first coupling, right? And then you see this uh, about the baptism, the ritual washings and laying on of hands. And then the second one, or the third one, excuse me, the third coupling, the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. What you see here is a past, present, future. It says past. What Christ has done for you in the past is that he has saved you, that he has announced justification over you, that he has pronounced you as justified without sin. And then you go forward as you go on in the walk of your life. And then he talks about how we walk through baptism, our identification, not just with Jesus, but with believers, the laying on of hands, receiving the Holy Spirit. And then we see this uh, that's the present. And then we see the future, right? We see the future with the resurrection of the dead and what's to come for us who know the Lord Jesus. So he says, y'all haven't even moved on beyond that. There's so much more I want to teach you, but you're just in the basics of past, present, and future. You're just in the, pre you're just in the basics of justification, sanctification, and glorification. And, and that's all we've been able to get to. And so you see this. So when we think about that, it just reminds me of this account. And then we go on to the verse four, verse four, chapter six. This, this is where it starts. Many wars have been fought over this. And so let's not start one today. It says this for it is impossible to renew to repentance. Those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm, they are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding him up to contempt. You know, what's interesting is that there's this warning over and over again that we see, and there's this warning over and over again that, that the word gives us is that we would not fall away. There's a warning that says that we need to stay alert. The enemy's prowling around like a lion, looking for someone to devour. We know the enemy always wants to seek out those he can steal and kill and destroy and all those kind of things. And so this is a reminder to us. It's a great warning that this author is putting together. And he's saying, be careful, do not fall away. Now, there's certain theories about this text. Is this written to save people? After all, it says this. It says, for it is impossible to renew to the pit, uh, repentance those who were once enlightened. They've come into the light. It's those who have tasted the heavenly gift of salvation, who shared in the Holy Spirit and have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, who have tasted God's word, tasted from it. Now, there's a certain saying here. Uh, the other hypo, uh, hypothetical situation is that this is, this is perhaps people who don't know the Lord. They, they've tasted, but they did not partake in the nourishment of the word. It's, it's like the old saying when it says, yes, I smoked, but I didn't inhale, right? Y'all remember that? 
I mean, not remember that from personal account, but remember that when that happened to somebody else, right? And y'all see this and it's unfolding here. And so there's, there's, is it saved people? Is it lost people that acted saved, but they never were? Uh, is this a sin that could only be committed by first century Hebrews that they would be tempted to walk back into the sacrificial system as sacrifices were still happening at the temple? Or is this just a hypothetical situation? And as we said, it's all kinds of people and all kinds of theologians that land on different places, but we want to walk through this text in the context and what it says. So you got these situation where these believers are not growing to maturity and then it switches and it says this, listen to verse one, therefore let us leave the elementary teaching and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings. And then it says in verse three, and we will do this if God permits. And then, so there's this we and this us language. And in verse four, for it is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened. And so there seems to be a separation here. There seems to be some type of separation that's unfolding and, and a dynamic that's uh, teaching us something important here as we look through the word. And then if you skip down to verse nine, listen to what it says in verse nine. Even though we are speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case, we are confident of things that are better and that pertain to salvation. So we have all different viewpoints coming at us, but there seems to be this pronouns of we and us in one camp and to those that leave the faith in another camp. And so this is a picture is that, is that we see this understanding that this is a different group of people that perhaps uh, were not saved and, and were never saved, but they looked saved. Now, we understand this as we uh, look at the words and we see this, and, and we should understand that the words crucify and put in Hebrews 6, 6. So look, look at this verse in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6. It's an important part of the verse. It says that they are participating in the crucifixion of Jesus. Listen, it says, and who have fallen away, this is because to their own harm, they are re-crucifying. They are currently doing that. That's the verb tense in, in the Greek. That the verb tense is they are currently, it's impossible to bring them to repentance because they are currently crucifying Jesus. And you say, how are they doing that? How are they holding him up in public shame? Well, have you ever known anybody that said, yes, I'm a Christian. And then they leave that place where they confess Jesus Christ and they live any way they want. Aren't they bringing great shame on Jesus? And isn't it similar to the shame that Jesus experienced while he's on the cross as he's nailed there and as he's humiliated and as people mock him and, and bring great disgrace upon his name? Isn't that exactly what people do who confess the name of Jesus, who say they follow Jesus, but yet their life shows no fruit of following Jesus? They just go on living as, as any way they want. And this is the picture, and we get this as we continue to read through these verses. Listen to what it says, verse 7, for the ground that drinks the rain that often falls on it and that produces vegetation useful to those for whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. Oh, I, uh, I think the world of Mr. Gerald and Miss Madonna that are here this morning. We have an empty seat this morning of a great farmer, Mr. Hollis Isbell. Mr. Hollis was a great friend of mine and I wish he was here to give me great lessons on this text about farming right now. But you see, what he would know so clearly and what Mr. Gerald's gonna to have to explain to me and teach me some things from your days of farming growing up is that for the ground that drinks the rain that often falls on it, that produces vegetation useful to those for whom it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. Do you see the common grace of God? That he brings rain on the ground and that rain falls on the ground. The ground soaks it in and based on the seed and the ground and the soil co composition, suddenly there's something that grows up and it's fruitful and it multiplies. All these kind of things. Yesterday, my son was eating an apple and he was eating that apple and he got so excited. He started looking at this apple. He said, oh, look at this apple. Look at this apple. And he said, mommy, we got to cut it open and find the seeds, right? And so he's eating down and he goes, I found the seeds. I found the seeds. And then he comes running to us. Can we plant these seeds? Can we go out and plant them right now? And he's digging them all out. And he comes back. He says, I got six seeds. We're going to have six apple trees. Look at all the stuff. We're going we're to have apples for days. Right? And he's, he's so excited about it. And, and as he got the skin off of that apple as he was eating it, he came in there and he said, look at this naked jaybird apple. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Y'all pray for us as we're raising that young one, right? (laughs) He found those seeds. He was excited and he was ready to plant them, right? And the word talks a lot about seeds and planting and all these kind of things. But it also talks about that though the common grace falls on the ground, though the common grace of God's blessing and rain, but listen what it says. It says it cultivated receives a blessing from God. Verse eight, but if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and about to be cursed and at the end will be burned. Oh, do you remember when Jesus is teaching about the sower? Do you remember about how he talks about throwing the seed? And he says this in Luke chapter 8. He, he talks to them and he says, and he explains the meaning. He says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed along the path are those who have heard. And then the devil comes in and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. There's one kind of, kind of people. And the seed on the rocks are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy, having no root. These believe, listen, these believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. So what does that tell us? That Jesus would teach us the same lesson from Hebrews chapter 6. That there are some that commit apostasy. They look like believers. They walk like believers for a little while. They say they believe, but yet... They're not true believers. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will be saved. And they'll point to their works on that day. But I will say, I never knew you. It's it's, it's the Lord saving you through his spirit, giving you a new identity, giving you a new heart. Some of you have gone to church and you think that's it. Some of you have been on a membership row. Some of you have been giving. Some of you have been going through all the motions. And that's what you'll point to at that day. You'll say, but didn't we do this? Didn't we do this? Didn't we do this? It's not about what you did. It's about what he does. And he does the work, right? And so this is the picture is that some of the seed falls on the rock. Those who hear it receive the word with joy. However, it has no root and they fall away in the time of testing. As for the seed that fell, listen, among thorns. These are the ones when they have heard, they go on their way and are choked with worries riches and pleasures of life and produce no mature fruit. The context, no mature fruit. You get to chapter six of Hebrews. Guess what? The problem is they're not growing to maturity, right? They're being choked out by, by thorns and thistles. And that's the illustration that he gives. And, but the seed in the good ground, these are the ones who having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it. And by enduring produce fruit. Right after he gives this parable in Matthew chapter 13, he shares another parable. He says, he says this, that the, that the farm owner, he, he goes out and he starts planting wheat. But in the night, the enemy comes and he plants weeds and thorns and thistles among it. And then they get out and they understand there's wheat and there's tares. And there's this great dynamic where they're growing up together and it's hard to discern which one is which. And so they go back to the landowner and say, what should we do? What should we do? And he says, let them both grow up side by side. And right now. In this very place, you could be an unbeliever growing up alongside with a believer. And there can be great similarities in your life and theirs. But the greatest difference is one is a new creation, one is not. One has been spiritually reborn, one has not. And then in that day, it says that when the harvest times comes, what will happen is that the landowner will separate the wheat from the chaff. The wheat from the tares. And he'll be able to separate. And it says he'll take the tares and he'll throw them into the fire for destruction. And he'll take those, the true harvest, and he'll store them in his place of storage. He'll store them in his barn. And we know this, that from the word, the Lord Jesus is right now preparing a place for those who believe in him. Having a place where they can dwell for all time. And then it goes on, and that's when we get to see. So we see all of this. We see the fruitlessness of those falling away. We see the frustration of the disciple maker. And then we see point number three, and we see the full assurance of the faithful. Let's look at this. It says, even though we are speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case, we are confident of things that are better and that pertain to salvation. For God is not unjust. 
He will not forget your work and the love you have demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. Now we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy, but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. Through what? Through faith, through the belief You know what's interesting? It says that it's impossible to restore those who have fallen away. It's impossible. That's what Hebrews 6 says. Do you know Hebrews 10 says it's impossible for the blood of rams and goats to take away the sin of the world. And did you know that in Hebrews 11, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 6. There's three sets of it is impossible in Hebrews. But listen to the good news so that you won't become lazy You will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. The Lord has given us a great reminder of the great cost, the great price that that he paid for us. He's given us a great reminder of why we need to stay persevering through faith in Christ Jesus. And that is the sign of the cross. That is the picture of his body broken and his blood poured out. So that we could know, we could be reminded of this moment and say, no, I'm standing firm on the faith of my God. I'm standing firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. I'm standing firm and I'm going to continue to serve the saints, to continue to love them, to continue to be diligent and not grow lazy in my reading of the word and and understanding of the word. And the promise of God is that for those who truly know him, those who truly follow Jesus through faith, There's an assurance, there's an assurance that nothing can pluck you from his hand. There's an assurance that he's made you a new creation and you can never revert back. Just like a caterpillar that crawls up into a cocoon, transforms into a butterfly. He never crawls back into that cocoon and comes back out a caterpillar. You have been transformed. By the goodness of our God. We're going to ask our deacons to come down as we observe this moment. And as we observe this moment, we just want you to be patient with us and really take some time in your heart to discern what God is doing for you. And for those that truly believe, we ask you to take this time of observing the Lord's Supper. For those who believe and follow Jesus, this is that moment where we just confess before him and we say, hey, in my flesh, I've put my hope in a lot of things. I I've done some things that look like walking away. Maybe you're like Peter. and Maybe you have denied that you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you say, I don't even know the man in public situations. Or or your testimony gets darkened like that. Or or maybe maybe in other situations, you're like Ananias and Sapphira. And you say, oh, I want to do great things for God. but, But not that. I won't go that far even though I said I would. Or maybe you're like Jonah. And you say, God, I'll go anywhere you send me. But don't send me there. Don't send me there. In every one of those examples, you understand that God's grace is sufficient. So today, you confess to the Lord any sin that might be before you. And then as we take these plates and we uncover them, we're reminded of a body that was broken. That he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of our God. So we that are sinful would understand the joy of this glorious thought and that we would understand that our sin, not in part, but the whole has been nailed to the cross and we'd understand that his flesh has achieved for us a righteousness that we could never achieve on our own and that as he became sin, they nailed him to a cross and his flesh was broken by nails, by whips in the most harsh and severe of ways His body was broken so that we may be made complete. Let's pray. God, we love you. Father, as these deacons go and they serve the saints, Father, would you remind us of our great need for Jesus? Would you remind us of our great need for his righteousness? And that, Father, it is by faith, God, a gift that you've given to us by grace, Father, that we believe. And it's by grace, Father, that we will continue to persevere. So, Father, hold us up and let us hold on to you. Father, we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all go.
night, you may be seated, on the night that Jesus came and broke bread with his disciples, we get this incredible, incredible picture. And he says, this, this is my body that was broken for you. So as you've confessed your sin before the Lord, we're just reminded of the great grace of our God that he sent his one and only son in the likeness of sinful man to be an offering, a sin offering for us. His body was broken, his blood was poured out. But right now we're thinking about the flesh. Galatians would go on to say that our flesh with its lustly passions has been nailed to the cross. So do this in remembrance of him. As our deacons are serving, we just want to remind you about the blood. We want you to think, see, because when we get to Hebrews chapter 6, there's a lot of people who read through this little section and they start doubting their salvation and the work of God or the security of their salvation. But in the grace of our God, he's given us something so powerful immediately following this text. And it says this in verse 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself, I will indeed bless you and I will greatly multiply you. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves and for them a confirming oath ends every dispute. Because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise, he guaranteed it with an oath so that through two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. Listen, verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Can we be encouraged this morning that Jesus did not enter into the Holy of Holies through the blood of goats and rams, but instead by his very own precious blood. And the text there has a promise that he entered there on your behalf through his blood. So as they're receiving and serving this cup that reminds us of his blood, the word reminds us of another picture of farming. It says the har harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. As you receive this cup, would you think about those workers that brought the gospel to you, that told you about the blood of Jesus? And would you give thanks to God that they were found faithful? And would you ask the Lord by his spirit to make you and help you be faithful in all things?
On that night, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is my blood. And since that very night, we have sung many hymns that remind us of the blood. And the question that Hebrews chapter 6 would lead us to is, are you washed in the blood? And it would lead us to a defining answer that if you are, praise him. That he's made this oath by two unchangeable things, his word and himself. And so our basis for faith is in Christ alone, through faith alone. And so we celebrate it by grace alone that he's given us such a wonderful gift. So do this in remembrance of him. I'm reminded of a story in closing. It happened in the 70s. There was a church meeting in Russia, a small house church of believers and the word started to grow and the Lord started to multiply their numbers. And in that moment, one Sunday, as they gathered together, a man came running into the church and he said, I'm going to destroy all of you. He started screaming out murderous threats to them. And before he could attack, the church circled around him, prayed over him, prayed that the Lord would change his heart, change his life. And after an intense prayer meeting, he agreed to meet with the believers of that church every day for two months. Through a mighty work of the Spirit, that man became a believer. Through a mighty work of the Spirit, that man became a pastor. And through a mighty work of the Spirit, God used that man to do incredible things throughout the entire world for his kingdom. As you leave here, there are a lot of people that need to know the love of Christ from the body of believers. It's what will change the world. So when we leave here, let's not leave mad. Let's not leave here discouraged. If the people at your restaurant don't give you your order just right, don't be mad. Bless them. Bless them and love them. May you continue to serve the saints and may you continue to love people the way we have been loved so sacrificially in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together and then have a time of invitation. God, we love you. And Father, as we cover these elements, we're reminded, Father, that they laid you in a tomb. And Father, that they covered that tomb with a large stone. And Father, as we think about that day, God, we're reminded at the same time, Father, that on the third day, the stone was rolled away. And Father, as we sang earlier, because you live, we can face tomorrow. Because you died, Father, we can know that you hold the future and our future is secure through the blood and body of Jesus Christ that has been sacrificed as an atonement for our sin. So Father, please help us to serve the saints today. Help us to love people whether they're part of the body of Christ or they are enemies and persecuting us, God, let us love them. And Father, may we see how you can transform the world. God, we love you and we thank you for this time together in your house. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand together as we have this time of invitation?
I want to encourage you before you leave, come back tonight. It's going to be a great time. Ryan's going to share more about it right before he sings this incredible last song he has ready for us, right? Last song. It's going to be great. All right. Now, I need to tell you about something important. There's a, there's a man in our church. His name is Butch Hillis. Butch Hillis uh, had a stroke. He's not doing so good. We want to pray for him. And we're going to pray for him and his wife, Kay, right now. Butch has been a part of disaster relief for years. And he's brought hope and a cup of cold water in Jesus' name all around this nation. And so let's pray together. God, we pray, Father, for Butch Hillis. We pray over Kay. God, we pray, Lord, over Patrick and Robbie and their families. God, we love this man and we thank you for him. We thank you, Lord, for his example before us. Father, we thank you for serving the Lord all around the nation. And God, we give you the praise and the glory for what you're going to do in his life. Father, we thank you for the promise of eternal life. And we pray over this dear family, God, that you would work all things for their good and also for your glory. And God, would you do a great work in Butch's life right now? Would you encourage him by our prayers? And would you do a great work in Kay's life right now? And would you encourage her, Father, as she's there beside his bed? Father, I pray blessings over them. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Ryan, turn them loose. We do hope you'll be back tonight for our night of worship, choir and orchestra. There'll be testimonies from Mike May and from uh, Dwan and Rita Malone, who's pastor at the Greater Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church over in Sheffield. And Rita's also going to be singing with our choir uh, tonight. A special time just of worship together. And so we do hope you'll be back. We'll be walking through the whole book of Hebrews tonight. So let's sing. Be 